Nehemiah is written in the first person and very likely includes some records of a personal diary, particularly in chapters 1 through 7 and in chapters 12 and 13, the, the personal nature of what Nehemiah shares makes you wonder if it didn't start off with his diary and then someone, maybe the men of Nehemiah in some kind of scholastic record circle, or perhaps Ezra, uh, organized the book into the way that you have it today. Nehemiah's first visit to Jerusalem was back in 445 BCE, uh, March of 445, and his second return was 12 or 13 years later, down in about, say, let's say 432 BCE, and so most people would say that the book comes into its final form around 430, while the events are still fresh in his mind, probably some of it comes from the recollections of what he's going through. This is a great book, and in all the books of the Bible, when you want to know about leadership, this book probably has your best tests of leadership. In fact, there are seven specific tests that he's going to go through, and, and it helps us to see how a man who was godly and prayerful handled a series of tests. And it reminds us of a couple of things. The greater your incentive to be a dedicated, discerning, zealous person in a work for God, the more you have a target painted on your back. If you're going to get something done, the enemy's going to get something to raise up against what you're getting done. And it seems to me that when you look through the book, it is really a personal record, not just of what went wrong at the time, but of how he dealt with each of the challenges of leadership. I would call to your attention, there's a couple different ways to divide the book. Now, students, the way that it's divided in uh, probably online is into four boxes, which is the return from Babylon to Jerusalem in chapters 1 and 2, the rebuilding of the city, which is chapters 3 through 7, the renewal of the commitment of the people to do the right things to repopulate the city and to guard it, and then the restoration of the people in chapters 11, 12, and 13. That's the way it's done in your uh, online uh, boxes. I actually like something else a little better. I like three because I think it organizes the book around what I think are its central purposes. And the first chapter, of course, is the call of Nehemiah as he gets it and as he accepts it. Chapters 2 through 6, I think, are the heartbeat of the leadership lessons of the book. And you're going to see that there are seven things that happen, two in chapter 4, two in chapter 5, three in chapter 6, that are tests against his leadership and how he sort of bobs and weaves as he's getting the, uh, the, the uh, right and left punches from the enemy thrown at him. He's going to have problems from within, problems from without. He's even going to have problems from inside himself where he's tempted. And so all of that will show up in the completion of the work if the work is understood to be the walls. But remember, God is never concerned simply about rebuilding Jerusalem. God, who built the heavens and the earth, could have simply whipped up another Jerusalem. By the way, he's going to do that someday. But that's not really hard for him. The building of the walls was toward the organization and reestablishment of worship of the people. The point of the book is not walls. He gets remembered for walls. The point of the book is worship. The point of the book is that you get people back into the position where they can follow God. You will go through stages of your life where God will challenge you in deeper ways because of the position you're at in life. And those with the hair of the almond blossom among us can tell each of you students that life is going to go faster, not slower, as you get older. Your the, the number of, of issues in your life in a given week will make it move so quick that that 24 hours looks like 22 minutes. And those long dog days of summer, that went with elementary school. Now you're going to have things moving faster and faster, responsibilities rising. Now, I tell you all that to say that my favorite division then is accepting the call, completing the work, and then organizing the people. I just want to look at this center section for a, section, uh, for a second and just suggest to you that these attacks are attacks you will find in every work that you try to do building a team or leading people. There will be criticism from without. 
and it will be loud and it will be long. There will be gossip inside the ranks. There will be draining complainers that will be all around you that will try to distract you from getting the work done because they don't have everything they need and they just need you to hear it and they don't seem to have any way to actually answer their issues. And then there'll be personal temptations, perks that go with the position that you're in, and you can take more perks or less, but they probably have a lot to do with what's going on in your heart. There'll be slander, intimidation, and sometimes even open threats. And each time, this book is going to help you to understand how they were dealt with. In the last part of the book, I would tell you that the things that he does to organize the people include getting the leadership and the guard, guards set up so that the, church, uh, so that the uh, city works the way it should. In fact, he will search the records to figure out who belongs in the city and who doesn't. But the heart of the book, the heartbeat of the whole book is chapter 8. And that will be a time of cleansing. That is a time of commitment, of renewal. And the passion of the book is found in chapter 8. So let's get started as we take a look through it. I think what's interesting to me in chapter 1 is that Nehemiah accepts a call from God. And I have to tell you that accepting that call is the foundation of all of his work. I, I will tell you something that Don Yuri taught me years ago when I was a college student. He said, be absolutely certain of your call from God because it's more important than your work. If you know God called you to do something, what difference does it make whether it's going well today? You're doing what you were called to do. Now, some of you, it's going to be obvious. How do I know if God called me to be a mom? You get pregnant. That's how it works. And then you know you're called to be a mom, okay? But, but other things will be God calls that are a little bit more difficult to perceive. Go to chapter 1, and what you'll see is at the very beginning, our text offers some conditions to recognizing a nudge of God. You never respond to need. You respond to nudge. Need is everywhere. And if you are gifted and talented, and I know you are, People will call on you, there's a need, there's a need, there's a need, and people run themselves ragged trying to stick their finger in all the cracks of the dam. That's not your call. You follow the nudge of God, that issue is the one you should be, uh, be dealing with, not all issues. you got to pick your spots, and you have to find the way that God has picked them for you and follow after them. Now, in the very beginning... Chapter 1, verse 1 says that these are the words of Nehemiahu or Nehemiah, son of Hachaliah. That's interesting because in the Bible, sometimes, unlike our society where people just get names based on their family history or somebody who's a celebrity that they happen to like, so they name their baby that, in the Bible, the names often are telegraphing um, something that's going to happen in the story. And that Nehemiahu or Nehemiah is God is my consolation, or Yahweh comforts me when I'm getting pummeled, things like that. That's his name. And by the way, that's going to be important in the book. But it's interesting, Hechaliah is actually the, uh, the word God is hidden, or wait for Yahweh, wait for God. He's not as obvious as you think. And so right in the beginning, what you have is God staging revelation and revealing things. Now, what I think is interesting is in verse 1, end of verse 1, it says, it happened in the month of Kislev in the 20th year while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers and some of the men of Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. I, I want you to note there that you have to prepare your heart for a time when opportunity knocks. And the reason I say that is, don't get lost in the detail, Nehemiah had a heart for the people before he made an inquiry. You ask because you want to know. And as a result, people were first, and they should be in every vision God will give you. How are the people at Jerusalem doing? How is the city of Jerusalem doing? So he's already tender-hearted towards something. When God is going to burden you, he's not going to burden you for something you've never thought about. He's going to burden you for something you've already been tenderized to. In verse 3, be ready for the burden to break your heart. Because at the end of verse 4, it says, I sat down having heard about the people and I wept for many days and I fasted and I prayed to the God of heaven. If you don't want a heartbreak, you don't want a call. 
Because with the call, your heart aligns with God's design for you and you want to see it so bad you can taste it. And what I think is interesting is that if Nehemiah hadn't set a pattern in his life to take the pain to the Lord, he would have become a dangerous person, not a godly leader. The burden isn't the problem. The place where you take it is. And leaders rise or fall on whether or not they share it with their people, share it with their wife, share it with their children, share it with their congregation, or get on their knees before God. Because sharing it with the wrong person will ruin the call that God has given you. If we search for a way to present the problem to the Lord, God might just give us an answer. And God places a burden on his heart. After he sat down and wept, verse 5 says, he began to pray, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven. He doesn't ask for an answer before he asks of God. In other words, start with God, Lord God of heaven. You don't see what I see. You see much more. From your perspective, you have a plan I can't touch. I can't see. It's interesting. He says he's a great and awesome God because we have to place confidence in God's ability to meet any need before we're really giving it to God. When you draw God down to where you are and make him part of the, you know, God, we're just not sure, he is sure. He is not a man that he would be drawn down to that position. What I think is interesting in verse 5 is that Nehemiah takes the time to rehearse God's program. He says, who preserves, preserves the covenant and, kind, and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Did you notice in verse 6 that Nehemiah actually gives his petition? Sometimes I listen to people pray and I don't know what it is they're asking for. And I wonder if God doesn't feel the same way. He, this is what he says. You know, Jesus presented it, give us this day our daily bread. That's pretty straightforward, right? Give us what we need. Nehemiah 6, let your ear now be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant. God, would you listen to me? I need you to hear me. I need to know that you're listening. And by the way, look at the end of verse 6. Do you remember Jesus taught his disciples to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors in Matthew 6? He said, I and my father's house have sinned. While he's asking God for something, he's not coming with a haughty spirit or some kind of entitlement. He's walking in going, God, I humbly acknowledge that we are in the position we're in because we put ourselves there. In verses 8 and 9 and 10, it looks to me like he understands that he is a son of privilege. And he reminds God of his promises. Do you know when he says, remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses in 8? Did, did you know that God will stand up to a test of his own word? If you say, Lord, your word says you would not have those, them perish, but would have them come to repentance. And I'm praying for my, my brother because I want to see him come to the Lord. Whatever it is, God will stand up to the test of his own word. I think when you get down to verses 11, uh, verse 11 uh, toward the end of the chapter, one of the things that Nehemiah does incredibly well is he relinquishes himself to God's purpose. I think it's a great thing to get an answer to prayer. I think it's a better thing to be one, to be an answer to prayer. And so God calls him out. But when he does, chapter 2 tells me that he is not just stuck in the work with no idea of what to do. See, God hasn't just left us with the desire to get a project done. He's given us a pattern and a primer of the basic skills that it's going to take to do it. So very quickly, mark out in your text in chapter 2 that the very first skill that you have is a prerequisite of prayer. Before you accomplish anything, there's the prayer that goes with it. And so in verses 1 through 4, you see at the end of verse 4, So I prayed to the God of heaven. The very first thing that happens is he walks in with a sad face, the king asks him what's wrong, and he takes a deep breath and prays before he goes forward. The prerequisite to do anything for God is talk to God about it. That sounds right, doesn't it? Here's what I've learned about honey-do lists. When I want to accomplish something and I want my wife to be happy, I ask her how she wants it before I make up in my own mind how it's supposed to be. Because when I make it up in my mind, almost certainly it's exactly what she didn't want. Now, I don't know how we got so out of sync with one another that I often come up with the wrong thing. She reads my mind well. I read hers not at all. And here's what I know. 
I don't read, my, I don't read God's mind very well either. And so you ask him, you talk to him, you go before him. Now, verses 5 and 6 mark the word negotiation. Because one of the skills a leader needs is to be able to petition the king. And I see at least three discernible axioms in chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. I see that in an exchange with a superior, we need to consider their needs and their perceptions before we ask for anything. This is the see it from the other guy's perspective or walk in his moccasins before you ask for time off at the job. If you're asking for time off right in the middle of the hardest project your boss has... Don't blame your boss if he comes back and snipes at you. you got to see it from his perspective. And in verse 5, he says, I said to the king, if it please the king. The other axiom that I see in verse 5 is that negotiation with the superior is only effective if it's based on a favorable reputation of the worker. If you're the guy who shows up early, stays until late, gets your job done, and makes your boss look good, he's more inclined to say yes when you need some time off. The best way for you to enter negotiation, look at the phrase in verse 5, if your servant has found favor before you. In other words, without a reputation, there's no question you're not going to get what you want. The third axiom that I see is in the end of verse 5 all the way through 8, be precise about your plan, your motive, and your timing. When you're involved in negotiation, tell them what you want, how long you need it, and, and, and exactly what its purpose is. What's the underlying motive of what you're doing? He said, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. The king, actually the queen, picks up and says, well, how long is that going to take? And then I gave a definite time. It tells me not only was he praying as he walked in, but this was not a haphazard plan. He already knew what it was he needed. And I think one of the things we have to understand is that negotiation is very much a part of what we're called to do. Now, in verses 7 and 8, I use the word administration. That is preparation of the plan. So after negotiating and the negotiating stage, it says that he has to come. He says, if it please the king, let letters be given to me for the governors beyond the provinces. And then he's going to ask for lumber and supplies. See, the bottom line is, the key to administration is it's most effective, effective when it's aimed at the essential needs of the project. And so, you know, a deckhand that organizes scrub brushes by size in the middle of a pirate attack is really not helping the ship. you got to be on point of what the need is. Doing something valuable to organize something when it's not necessary is, not, is just keeping yourself busy. There's a difference between good workers and busy workers. I think one of the things that I find most frustrating in leadership is it's hard to get people to keep the main thing the main thing. And honestly, it's hard for me to get myself to keep the main thing the main thing. Now, what's interesting to me is that he needed to arrive well, so he needed safe passage. He was going to need supplies to build the stuff, so he looks for timber. And, and you know, i got to tell you, somebody said this years ago. I wrote it down because it was one of those things that struck me. Pin the tail on the donkey is a fun party game, but it's a terrible way to run your life and your marriage and your bank accounts and, and raising your children. There's a lot of people who don't appreciate what administration does. How about the next one? Get down to verses 9 and 10. I use the word perception here. This is the consider consideration of the probable opposition. Don't go into it thinking it's going to be easier than, you, than, than it ever has been in your past. Okay? Uh, I'm digging posts for a fence, and I just found out that somebody decided back when to bury a bunch of concrete and rebar in my backyard right in line with where my posts are going down for my fence. Should I be surprised? No, it's a Smith project. Stuff like that always happens. So here's the thing. You have to assess threats in order to be useful to God. And that's what I think he does in verses 9 and 10. Look at the end of verse 10. It was displeasing to these guys who were beyond the river that, that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. There's always somebody with a vested interest in the status quo. And you try making changes and you're going to butt heads with them. Go down to verses 11 to 15. I think that's about inspection. It's interesting. Verse 12 says that Nehemiah got to Jerusalem and rose in the night and didn't tell anybody what he was going to do. 
And he went down and walked along the ruins of the side of the hill. It was unexpected. It was undisclosed. It was unparaded. Because you cannot expect what you will not inspect. You must know the size of the problem. And reports only get you so far. I use for verse 16, discretion. It's telling your plans only when you're ready to tell them only to who you think needs to hear them. Discretion is an important thing. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. Don't tell everybody everything about everything. You know, there's some stuff about you we really don't want to know. It's really okay. To be honest does not mean to disclose everything you've ever thought or done. We don't want to know, okay? We love you. Hold some stuff for secret. Verses 17 and 18, I call it presentation. Before you inspire people to get on board with the project, you need to package the idea. That's part of management. It's the reason that when we launch a building program, we get an architect to draw a picture of the building, even if that's not what it's going to look like. Why? Because people go, oh, that's a building. And then they get the idea. You want to inspire people, you've got to give them what you're trying to go for. And I think in verses 17 and 18, he says at the end of 18, let us arise and build. They get the idea. They know what you want them to do. There's a lot of leaders, I think, frustrated by walking around not telling anybody what it is they want everybody to do. And then you get down to verses 19 and 20, and this begins conflict management. And conflict management will be a part of every great enterprise you ever try to lead. Sanballat the Hornite, Tuvia the Ammonite, Geshem the Arab heard what we were doing. They mocked us. They despised us. You know what I think is interesting? Right here from chapter 2, Nehemiah already has a concept of the real motive behind the words of the leaders. He, he answers them. And, and by the way, this is a great answer. It's a very polite one. God's at work. He won't be stopped by you or anybody else. We're going to do this building. Your participation has not been requested. You have nothing to do with this issue. Thanks for your concern. Love and kisses, Nehemiah. And I mean, it's just a straight, direct, sorry, but we got a job to do, and you're in our way, so we're just going to keep going. I, I think that chapter 2 establishes that God gave a valuable pattern. Now, when you get into chapter 3, I want you to see you're going to start moving closer and closer to this rising tide of trouble. But you know what? I think the first thing you have to do before you're going to be able to accomplish anything for God is get a call. The second thing you're going to have to do is get all the assets in place. And the third thing you're going to have to do right here in chapter 3 is build your team. The key to progress is consistently doing the right things the right way. And it's interesting Chapter 3 and chapter 12 in Nehemiah are the two bang your head against a rock chapters if you're a teacher of the Bible. Why do I say that? Because from verse 1 down to verse 32, there is nothing but a litany of names, one name after another. And if you're not familiar with Hebrew names, this is one of the longest readings of your life. But here's what I want you to know. There's something marvelous there. It took me forever to figure out what the chapter was good for. And here's what it is. Laws of team building. Did, did you notice, if you drop your eyes into verse 1, then Eliashib, the high priest, arose and his brothers, the priests, and built the sheep gate. They consecrated it. They hung its doors. They consecrated the wall to the Tower of the Hundred and the Tower of Hananel. And you say, so what? Well, first of all, archaeologically, we can find these places, and that's cool. So I, at one time in Jerusalem, I used to give a tour from Nehemiah, just showing you what's from Nehemiah that you can see. It was a half-day tour in Jerusalem, a lot of fun. But did you notice in verse 1 that it started with the high priest, and sweat and godliness went hand in hand. And the high priest got out there first, because the work is part of the worship. You need people who are so dedicated to what God is doing that they're going to get a, uh, get a work up a sweat doing it. And I got to tell you, people get lost in these things. That list of names is not terribly impressive. Churches can swell in numbers, but size only matters if people are in the Word and on their knees. Otherwise, it's just a big crowd committed to themselves. What I love is that if you take a moment and you look at the End of verse 1, it says, they consecrated it and hung its doors. That's not an idle phrase. 
they recognized that the work they were doing, even though it was parts and pieces and hardware, was a holy thing. Because God called for those walls to be built, and it doesn't matter if the world thinks some walls around Jerusalem are important. God said it had to happen. And when God is behind it, it's a holy work. It's interesting that they did the most important thing first. They consecrated the wall from the Tower of the Hundred and the Tower of Hananel. Now, that doesn't say anything to you, but it means it's the north wall, and that's the weakest point of Jerusalem. When you start your work, put your best workers on the most critical spot. And put men who are going to understand the, the gravity of the task and the awesomeness of God. By the way, if I went on to the rest of these, this chapter, I could show you that the people of God had to be led to get on board and do the work. And some of them, did you notice in verse 5, the Tekoaites made repairs. What I find interesting about the Tekoaites is they actually are found in two different sections. They did double the work that other people did. The men of, of, of Jericho came up and they helped. And what's interesting is the team was not distributed evenly. And when you lead people, you will find that is true. Some people will do a lot more work than everybody else. What I think is interesting is some people will think they're too good for the work. Those are in the second half of verse 5. They're the nobles that couldn't get themselves behind it. There's some people that are going to say, you know what? I just think I might be a little too good for this. You know, I think if you put me over on that job, have you done a team job or a work day and you found somebody drifted from their job to somebody else's job where they felt more suitable? Now, what's interesting is when you lead nobles, when you lead nobles, they're going to think that they did an equal part after the work. But during the work, they're going to ride the top of it on the labors of other people. In verse 14, I saw that somebody had to do the refuse gate or the dung gate. You know what that tells me? Some people do the work that's a little more pungent than everybody else. And I look down there and I see uh, that, that, that there were some people who would only work for personal benefit. In verses 10 and verse 23, I spotted a few guys who only repaired the wall next to their own house. Some people are only going to do the part that benefits them. They're going to look like they're on the team. They're going to look like they're pulling the weight, but they're only really interested in how it fits them. I think it's interesting that you can also count on God to supply some people who will do it with such fervency, your heart will be blessed. I have led people, and I got to tell you, verse 20, after him, Baruch, the son of Zabai, zealously repaired another section. Now, I don't know what it means to zealously do mortar work, but I'm thinking that guy's up there throwing that concrete and, and dropping those things in so fast that you knew he was committed to the work. I want to take a moment and skip a stone across chapters 4, 5, and 6 for now because there are a series of criticisms and a series of tests that come up. Opposition can be a point of discouragement in leadership or it can be a point to refocus you to recommit yourself to the Lord. It's all in how you respond to it. And when I get into the beginning of, of chapter uh, uh, 4, what I see is in verses 1 through 6, that there was Sanballat and Tuvia and Geshem were making public statements about criticizing the work. Sanballat heard about the wall. He didn't go see it. He was angered by what he heard, and he was mocking what they were doing. But he didn't go out and inspect it. The critic is often driven by hearsay. And so criticism without facts offered for emotional reasons in sarcastic tones is the first six verses of chapter 4. Did you notice what he did? Character assassination. What are these feeble Jews doing? The scramble attack raised questions about their real motives. He says, are they going to restore it for themselves? Listen to the way they, that he taunted values. Can they offer sacrifices? Like, wow, that's important, isn't it? It's interesting. The, they will sarcastically reduce the work. Now stop. God told them to build that wall. That was God's work. Every sarcastic, every attack, every criticism raised up was raised up not ultimately against Nehemiah, but against God. And when you step by, when you stop by and you see that, and you see that they hadn't even seen the wall, they didn't do an inspection, they weren't qualified in architecture, they probably had little background in building amongst themselves. They just had strong opinions. We live in a day when 
people can go on the internet and the only qualification it takes to have a strong opinion is an internet connection. You don't have to have any knowledge at all, you just have to have an internet connection and you can weigh in on people who have real expertise and decide to rate them. Now, in verses 7 to 23 of chapter 4, there was also some discouraging winds of gossip. Verse 8 talks about conspiring words. Verse 11 talks about rumors. They were designed to distract and to discourage and to destroy the work of God. It's not about killing the people. It's about stopping the work. And so a distraction is raised. You know what? The design was to get people to panic, and people that panic inevitably leave, out, leave God out of the equation. So all of this discouraging gossip comes up. In verse 14, he says, When I saw their fear, I rose to speak to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, and said, Do not be afraid of them. Underline this, remember the Lord. He's great. He's awesome. Fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, your houses. Here's the thing. Opposition is a normal part of dealing in a fallen world and trying to accomplish God's task. Expect it, get on board, but be simple and direct about handling it. Remember the Lord. Go to chapter 5. And what happens is now two more tests arise. In the first 13 verses, some broken-spirited people come up. Gossip and criticism have caused them to be crushed under a load of discouragement. <coughs> One of the things that the enemy does is discourage the people of God from doing the work of God so that the leaders of God have to spend more time on the people than the task. There are whole churches that are spending time, so much time healing as a church, they're not reaching anyone. And that's, the, that's why the enemy keeps ripping into them because all that bleeding inside the church stops anybody from going outside the church. You can fight all day and never get out to the outside of the circle and actually reach where the enemy is. So handling broken spirits comes up, and in verses 1 to 5, people were broken because they felt like other people were taking advantage of them, even within amongst the Jewish people. And they were actually having to mortgage themselves in order to do the work. And, and Nehemiah actually comes to understand the words in verse 4, We have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields. We've mortgaged our fields, our vineyards, verse 3, our houses, so that we could get grain to get through the famine. And he has to carefully and directly move people through, how can you take advantage of these, your brothers? Men and women, as you lead people, you need to know that if they could get along on their own, they wouldn't need leaders. Okay? The fact of the matter is you're going to have to sit down and you're going to have to say to people, you're, you're mishandling this. You're doing it the wrong way. And the point is that there are broken spirits that leaders have to face. They feel abused and often for a good reason. So what does a leader do? I see that in chapter 5, there are a couple of responses. He reaches out to the people with the broken spirit in verses 7 through 13, and he, and he praises God and brings them into a place where he commits the ultimate judgment of people to God. And then there's the fourth test, and that one is the lore of gain. Be aware of this in verses 14 to 19. Not only will you face tests from without, you will face a test from the old man within. And there were four great benefits Nehemiah could have had. He, could have, he was entitled to tax people for his own care. He was entitled to, to, to uh, live well. He was entitled to allow his servants to, by force, get the people to come into submission. He was allowed to personally elevate the status of those close to him, and he doesn't do any of those things. Why? Because good leaders are aggressively, deliberately generous people in verse 17. Good leaders are comfortable and hospitable. Awkward people don't lead well. A church called me the other day and said, could, did I have anybody I could recommend as a pastor for them? And I said, you know, I got a couple of guys I think you could look at, but would you just do me one favor? Mark down on your list of qualifications somebody who's not weird, somebody who actually is okay in their own skin, because people who are awkward can't lead well. You got to know who you are. You got to know what your gifts are, what your calling is, and walk with God. In chapter 6, I see three punches landed by the enemy on Nehemiah slander, intimidation, and threat. And when I look through chapter 6, I see each time slander, verses 1 through 9. The opposition sets up just as the wall breaches were stopped, just as they come to a place where there's no more opens in the wall. Now, all of a sudden, 
new slander rises. Come on, whenever you're moving forward, expect the enemy to innovate the things that he's done. The father of lies will tell lies. That's how he got his title. And what's interesting is, listen to the way they report things. Verse 6, it is reported, do you hear it? Someone said, I heard, I read this the other day, not factual reporting, cloudy report, not cloud, cloudy reporting. The other thing I think is that exaggeration and inaccuracy of baseless rumors are the order of the day when the enemy's involved. Watch how people tar good leaders. They do it with baseless reports and inaccurate statements that can't be attributed directly anywhere. Verses 10 through 14, when that didn't work, he went into a time of a personal threat against his life. He says, I entered the house of Shemaiah, verse 10, chapter 6, son of Deliah, uh, son of uh, Mahitabel, who was confined at home, and he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us close the doors. They are coming to kill you. Don't lose track of this. He wasn't trying to save Nehemiah's life. He was trying to get him to walk inside the temple where he wasn't allowed to go. Because by saving his own life, but going inside the temple and acting as a priest, he would have brought down on himself defamation to everybody else, and that's the ball game right there. Nehemiah says, oh no, I won't go. Now, verses 15 to 19, in addition to that, he slides off that threat against his life, and now there are underminers that are working underneath. You see it in verse 15? The wall was completed. Verse 16, our enemies heard of it, and all the nations around us, they lost their confidence. And what's interesting so, is now the enemy seeds a backstory. Somebody who's in the work in verses 17, 18, and 19 that is collecting up IOUs and allegiance cards to run a shadow government. It was Pastor Ralph Wiley who said years ago, the one thing I've learned about church leadership is this. If they call me to a church, my only question is, don't show me the board, tell me who's really in charge. I want to deal with them. You see... There's always a backstory shadow leadership that operates in long-standing organizations, and you have to understand that, or you're never going to make sense of it. All right, now, we get to chapter 7, and the walls are built. They've been finished in chapter 6. He's withstood seven attacks. When you get to 7 to 13, this sounds undoable in the minutes we have left. It's not. Because in chapter 7, there's a simple restart button. The real work of God is not simply about building walls and assets. It's about getting people on board and seeing transformation in the lives of people. How many a church is excited to put up a new building, but the building only houses the people. The building is only the asset. Assets make things possible. People make them happen. And what's interesting is that in chapter 7, verse 1, he passes the command over and he focuses on setting key players in place. After the wall had been rebuilt, I set the doors in place. The gatekeepers, musicians, and the Levites were appointed. Now, I don't know if you can catch right off of this, but after we got our walls up, I needed to organize our worship. Why? Because that's what the walls were for. And without the worship, the walls are just walls. And then he places a pattern of a leader. I put in charge, verse 2, in Jerusalem, my brother Hanani. He puts somebody that he cares about, somebody that cares about him, somebody that understands what God has taken him through, and he puts that person in charge, and they begin to take over the city. And then in verse 3, he says, the gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. He sets procedures that protect the people, because just because they have walls and gates doesn't mean they know how to use them. Verse 4, the leader reevaluates re the difficulties ahead. He begins facing the problem. The city was large, it was spacious, but there weren't a lot of people that wanted to live in it. Can, can you be open to the idea that although the city was rebuilt, the sewers weren't? Although the city walls were rebuilt, the downtown district wasn't. There were a lot of rubble piles and smelly situations in that city. And what I can tell you is, that each phase of the work's growth required a new evaluation from a leader as to what was going to be necessary. 
So verse 5 says, God put into my heart to assemble the nobles. I found the genealogical record and I started figuring out who belongs here. Leaders don't just look at problems. Anybody can find the problem. Leaders look for solutions. And so he pulls out the genealogical re record. A leader couldn't make those who didn't fit in the parameters happy at the expense of the work. So he asks God, who belongs in the city? What, what's interesting to me is it wasn't Nehemiah's job to convince God how the Bible should have been written. It was his job to take the Bible, apply it to the situation, and conclude what needed to be done. And that's what he does in chapter 7. Go all the way to the end of 7, 766 to 69. All through his journal, you have to admire the care with which Nehemiah kept track of things. Number of core group, 42,360. Number of servants, 7,337. Choir, 245. Number of livestock, horses, 736. Mules, 245. Camels, 435. Asses, 6,720. I am not completely sure why it is, but I have discovered something, and I pass it to you right here next to this verse. Make a note of it. I've discovered in ministry that there are a lot of people that fear keeping records. I'm not sure if they're feeling like it's going to show a decline or a lack of growth. Carl Rogers was the historian and philosopher who said the facts are always friendly. It seems to me that there's a lot of people in, rec in, in ministry that don't like to keep records of what happened. And by the way, in 70 to 73, he tells you the price of the new settlement, and it's in staggering numbers. And that gets you to chapter 8. Chapter 8 is the heartbeat of the book. It is the greatest spot in this incredibly positive book because God gave a means to revive cold-hearted people and give them spiritual life and restore passion from breathlessness. How did he do it? Well, it came up to the seventh month. That's what chapter 7, verse 73 says. The time of the year that brings in all the great festivals and the beginning of the year. And the people gathered and they asked for the law to be read. And chapter 8 opens up with the fact that they, they asked somebody who had a knowledge of the text and a passion to explain it. They called on Ezra. By the way, Ezra has been here a whole generation before. He's a known quantity. And the reading of the word from verses 2, and two through 4 of chapter 8 is a blessing as the people stand around on a podium and the people begin to react. In verse 6, you see the words, Amen, Amen. Here's the thing. The revival came from hunger. It was communicated by somebody who had a passion to follow God. Verses 7 and 8 tell me that there was a careful rendering of the word. They didn't just hear the word, they understood the word. They made it complete so the people could grab it. And then there was a response of the leaders in verses 9, 10, and 11, weeping when they heard the words of the law at the end of verse 9. And what's interesting is they had to be instructed, go, eat the feast. The joy of the Lord is your strength. They didn't feel joyful. They felt miserable. Meetings with God aren't always designed to be happy times. Conviction's part of the package. And what's interesting is in verses 12 through 18 of chapter 8, there was a, an incredible celebration. Some people think God's only happy when we feel miserable about our sin. I, I grew up in a time when a really good church service is when you came out feeling like a wretch. A worm, you know, all those old hymnology. A saved a wretch like me. That was good preaching right there. I just want to remind you that God gave you chocolate and taste buds. What does that tell you about God? Some of it's just about the fun. And by the way, chapter 8, verse 13 says that good food will make you hungry for better food. And good truth will make you hungry for more truth. And, and chapter 8 just blesses my heart. Go to chapter 9 for a minute. Right in the middle of this time, great worship followed with great thorough cleansing. Celebration flowed from, without hindrance from a clean heart. And in chapter 9, what you see is a simple response. In chapter 9, 1 through 3, when people heard the word of God, they changed their pattern. That is... 
They assembled with fasting. They changed their dress. They put on sackcloth. They put on dirt. They got alone with their believing family in chapter 9, verse 2, because the world wasn't the place to air their sin. They, they made public confession. They, they made confession of the iniquities of the fathers. They went back and said, we've been this way for a long time. They investigated God's word for, for, for truth. They, it says in verse 3, they stood there in the place and they read from the book of the law of the Lord. The Bible was indicating not only conviction, but transformation. And they began by changing their symbolic way of living, stopped their eating and changed their clothes. But verses 4 through 38 say that the cry of the people that started ended up with a, a content of praise. I see in verse 6, you alone are Lord. You know what that is? Circle that in verse 6, you alone are Lord. You're never going to deal with sin until you deal with the mastery of God over your life. You have the right to be in charge. That's what they're saying. In verse 7, you're the one who chose your people. I want you to skip all the way down to 32 to 38 toward the end of the passage because there's a covenant of change before God. Look what they did. Do not let all the hardship seem insignificant before you which has come upon us, our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers. You are just in all that has come upon us. Do you see it? Verse 30, 36, we are slaves today. Verse 38, now because of all this, we are making an agreement in writing. And they begin to write down, these are the steps we're going to take to walk with you. See, people can talk about theoretical, theological change. It's when they change what they're doing in their daily walk that you see repentance. Everybody's gone to camp. Everybody's had that high. You know, oh God, I'm just going to be yours forever. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to follow you all the days of my life. And if you can only get past the third week. And here's the thing. It's when you change the patterns of your life that we know that something is actual, real, actually real in your life. If the Lord is first in your life, how would I be able to tell? You get to chapter 10, and that's the beginning of the expression. The end of chapter 9 was, verse 38, because of all this, we're making an agreement in writing. Well, my faith is best expressed in my priorities. If you can't see what I believe by how I live, I am not living honestly. And so I look at this verse, and in chapter 10, verses 1 through, oh, all the way down to 27, there's another laundry list of names. But here's the thing. The rest of chapter 10 makes clear what they were doing. They were accountable to the covenant. Why are their names there? Because there is a time to step up and be named for your commitment. There's a time for you to step up and say, I'm signing on this line. This is something I'm going to do. And you know what's interesting? You get down to what they did, and in chapter 10, verse 30, they said, we're not going to have any inter intermarriage. You know why? Because when we read God's word, we knew that it had to affect relationships. We're not going to exempt relationships out of tolerance and allow that to go by. And then it says, not only are we not going to be intermarried, but we're going to honor the Sabbath in verse 31. That is, God is in charge of my time. In verses 32 and 33, he's in charge of my money. He's in charge of the sabbatical year, how I advance my business. In verse 34, he's, he's in charge of my sacrificial surrendered work life. In, in verse 35 through 39, he's in, he gets first fruits. He gets the tithes. I am committed to public testimony. I will not forsake his house, verse 39. In other words, all of the practices of my life are going to show, show, show what I'm saying my priorities are. You can talk about priorities, but until you live them, they're not real. Go to chapter 11. And in chapter 11, leadership is both a gift and a divine appointment. It's bestowed, but it's deliberately cultivated. When I read through chapter 11, here's what I find. I find that now the walls are built, the people are operating, the right people are living in the city. There's been an incredible move of God among them. And then there was a problem with the role of leadership that one has to recognize and accept, and it's in verse 1. The leaders of the people lived in Jerusalem, but the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem. you got to remember that though there's walls around the city, the sewer system isn't working and people don't want to live there. So I noticed that in chapter 11, verse 1, the leaders stepped up and they lived there. 
Because leadership isn't about comfort. It's about energizing people to move into the vision God called you for. Nehemiah got the walls up, the guards in, the worship going, and now he was calling on leadership to set up Jerusalem and get that thing rebirthed and move that city forward because that's what God told him to do. You know what else I noticed? There's a process involved in leading in verse 2. Deliberate affirmation. And the people blessed all the men who volunteered. Did you see that? See, people not only need to be called to do what God has told you to do, they also have to be affirmed when they're doing it. I think in verses 3 to 24, it shows you all these interesting personalities. Like verse 4, some of the sons of Judah and some of the sons of Benjamin lived in Jerusalem. They, they were close by. That wasn't such a big sacrifice. But I read from 10 to 14 that beyond the layman, that there were priests that were living there. And if I, if I would wager and I were a betting man, the, the city services were probably pretty lousy. So some priests thought the best way to operate the temple was to stay there even if their toilets don't flush. I noticed that in verses 15 to 18, there are Levites, and I'd circle in 15 the word Levites. I'd circle in verse 19 the word gatekeepers, civil servants. And just go through it and see that God called all kinds of people to deal with following through on this vision. You know what I noticed about Nehemiah? He appreciated and cared for the people that were following through on a vision God gave him. To be personal for just a minute, one of the most humbling things about leadership is when you see people following a vision God gave you. And all of a sudden you turn around and you realize it's not for you they're following. It's that God has seized their heart and their passion. And God is bringing to life something very real. It is humbling and it's overwhelming. And it's been my partner all the way through ministry, watching people grab onto visions God gave me and as I articulated them, they became something. And then they became morphed into what he wanted them to be, which was better than what I could have done. I want you to go to chapter 12. It is the second really bang your head against a stone chapter in this book. Chapter 3, long list of names. Chapter 12 has a big people list. Chapter 12 is two things. It's very simple. We can do it in one minute. It's a long list of people followed by a prayed procession and ceremony of the dedication of the city. Why do you need this? Why do you need to know a long list of people that were named here? Well, part of this is because it's a cross-check list with some of the lists in Ezra to help you know that there's a legal um, inheritance that has been rooted into the scriptural code itself. I, I think it's interesting that there are different groups that are given to you in, uh, in chapter 12, verses 1 to 26. I see a group of the people who returned with the original group under Sheshbazar and Zerubbabel in uh, the first uh, 11 verses. And then I see a whole uh, group that are priests of the second generation. And then I see a third group of names that appears to interrupt the list because he's trying to compare that time has passed and records are being updated. And that is so riveting to you that you read chapter 12 and you say, why is this in the Bible? Well, here's the thing. Heritage is important. History is essential. Rejoicing was important, and people who draw others to worship are remembered. And for the balance of the passage, there's a dedication ceremony from chapter 12, verses 27 to 47. All it is, is a big parade to dedicate the city. Why do you need to know? Because he's going to tell you the people that did it. He's going to tell you the path that they took. He's going to tell you who was in the procession where. He's going to tell you the testimonies of the people. Go down to 1243 for a minute. It says, on that day they offered great sacrifices. They rejoiced because God had given them great joy. Even the women and children rejoiced so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard from afar. Now don't get lost in that. What do you mean even the women and children rejoiced? They weren't the people that put the wall up. But they were the families of those who put it up. And they stood back and went, great job. And here's what I know about men. That was their best day when their wife was going, good job, honey. Good job. The world will not be changed by sour-faced believers that disagree with moral innovations in our society. They're going to be energized by people who praise and wonder at the power of God. And I love that at the, at the end of chapter 12, 
They perform, verse 45, worship of their God in the service of purification. You want to know what Sanballat and Tuvia and Geshem were really worried about? That. It wasn't the walls. It wasn't the taxation. It wasn't the rebellion. It was that the enemy hates praising, worshiping, thankful-hearted people. He hates it. Go to the last chapter as we finish up. You'd think now that you're down at the close and there'll be no more leadership tests. Oh no, oh no. These are leadership tests, three of them, that come specifically from the people of God. In chapter 13, verses 1 to 14, inconsistent leadership that keeps the vision without compromise is really, you know, you want consistent people, but they're inconsistent. They get a piece of the vision, and then they go off in some other direction, and that inconsistent leadership begins to blur. Let me say this. In many visions, there is blur. The more people that add their own idea or adaptation to a vision, the more blurry it becomes from what it originally was. And in the first 14 verses... There is something, in the first four verses, they introduce the idea of intermarriage, and they, don't, they drop it and don't pick it up. And then they tell you that Eliashiv, the priest, stopped and cleaned out part of the temple and took it over for his own personal use. That instead of storing the utensils for the temple, he was storing his own stuff. And then it just leaves that there and goes on to a second problem that there was an incremental easing of commitment to the passionate testimony of a walk with God. Go down to verse 15 for a minute, because 15 to 22 is the second big problem. It says that they were treading wine presses on the Sabbath in verse 15, and in verse 16, outsiders, Gentiles from Tyre, were being allowed to do it. So not only had they ignored the holiness of the temple when Eliashib put his stuff in it, but now they were ignoring the holy day God gave them, and they were not only doing that, they were letting Gentiles participate in the overall uh, defamation of the Sabbath. Now, be ready for this. When people don't take God's sacred space carefully and they don't take God's sacred worship time carefully, verses 23 to 31, they will no longer be distinct in their walk. So verse 23 says, In those days I saw that the Jews had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. When the people let their guard down on holy places and holy times, they compromised in holy relationships. And the book closes with these words. Thus I purified them, verse 30, from everything foreign and appointed duties for the priests and the Levites, each to his task. And I arranged for the supply of wood at appointed times and for the first fruits. Now listen to his ending. Remember me, God. Remember me for good. He signs off the end of his diary saying, God, I hope you saw it. Can I just remind you that in leadership, the place you take your hopes, your dreams, your affirmation is not your congregation. It's your God. Amen. And if you mess that up, you will chase the affirmation of people and it will ruin your leadership. Nehemiah.